Welcome to the Nonfiction Writers, podcasting in a great way. I'm Ryan Aber, joined by Jason Kersey. We're here to talk OU football, which is uh, an interesting endeavor these days, Jason. Oh my gosh, man. What a <laughs> what a disaster that game was. I mean, I, I could... I, I, I'm not surprised that Baylor scored a lot of points. I'm not surprised that uh, that OU lost, but nobody could have seen that coming. Yeah, and it's it's unbelievable that uh, a lot of the year there's been a lot of heat on a certain uh, coordinator for OU who resides on the offensive side of the ball, Josh mm-hmm. Heupel. Yep. And Saturday, 48-14, to 14, OU manages 14 points, held to under 30 for the first time since, what, uh, middle of last season, I since think? Since Baylor last yeah, season. Yeah, Baylor last yeah. season. And uh, But all the heat, not so much on Josh Heupel this week. It's on the other side of the yeah, ball. Yeah, there's still some heat on Josh <laughs> Heupel, but, uh, but I, I don't think that Josh Heupel necessarily did a terrible job himself on Saturday. I know that sounds weird when they only scored 14 points. Um, but to me, Mike Stoops is the coordinator that had a way rougher time uh, Saturday, and there could be any number of reasons for that. But uh, but and and really, frankly, the last few games, um, going back to Kansas State, even TCU, I think that you can really pinpoint a lot of the problems on the defensive side of the ball, and um, they're they're going to have to get some of that fixed. And, and and to me, the other thing that that I think is interesting is is you know, it's easy for these coaches to come in and say, well, the the players aren't executing. You know, you can call whatever you want. There are no magical plays, as both Stoops brothers have said this year. Um, and, and I think there's some truth to that. I, I think that, you know, after the game Saturday, I went out uh, to a restaurant with a couple of the other guys on the beat, and, and the word that was used was, I think Mike Stoops is bewildered right now. <laughs> I really think he's just bewildered. And... Usually when stuff goes wrong, there's things that maybe not everybody can see, you know, minor breakdowns, reasons why these things don't work. On Saturday, especially, and I've written about this twice earlier this week, uh, on Saturday, the, especially the first drive of the second half, it was very clear what OU's problem was. OU's problem was they didn't feel comfortable enough having their defensive backs, especially Julian Wilson and Amon Thomas, uh, on the left side of the field, uh, play up in press coverage. While I mean, Zach Sanchez was two yards closer to the line of scrimmage than any other DB, sometimes as much as five yards closer to the line of scrimmage than any other DB. And Baylor kept taking advantage of that by just Bryce Petty taking a step or two back, turning to his left, firing to a wide receiver, and then they'd gain you know, anywhere from three to, to ten yards just on that alone. Yeah, I mean, that was that was baffling. But um, And then, you know, Julian Wilson comes off the field and him and uh, Mike Stoops are, are in an argument, it looked like. And there's, it's just, it, it, it was just a, when that happened, after that first drive, you knew the game was over. There was no way OU's offense was going to be able to score enough points to keep up. And, and there was no way OU's defense was going to stop them. Because after that, they went out and they put Jordan Thomas in the game, who I think is eventually going to be a really good player. But right now, I mean, he's a true freshman going up against Baylor's offense, going up against Bryce Petty. And there was just no way you could you could have really, really high hopes for that. So um, I think that's, to to get off topic for just a second, I think that's a, a, a very str- strong indictment of Stan Von Taylor and Dakota Austin, um, both guys that I thought were going to play a lot this year, and they haven't played hardly at all. Yeah, I, I agree with you on that for sure. But what can they do moving forward now? Uh, good for OU uh, in some ways. They end the season playing uh, Texas Tech, Kansas, and Oklahoma State. Uh, offenses that have, have struggled for most of the year, not going to put up a whole lot of points. Really, uh, you know, three out of the four worst teams in the I don't know if you put Texas in that. I mean, the, the Texas OSU game this weekend is going to come down to bowl eligibility for one of those teams probably. But uh, certainly not the top division in this uh, this Big 12 conference. Uh, on the other hand, of course, last year, uh, which Bob Stoops likes to point out, he pointed out uh, several times yesterday what happened last year after they lost a couple, after they lost to Baylor, which is they came back and they beat a good Kansas State team. 
They beat uh, a good Oklahoma State team and then went to the the Sugar Bowl, found their way there, and beat a very good Alabama team, obviously. Mm -hmm. This year they don't have uh, the schedule that allows for that kind of uh, rebound regardless of the scores that they put up these last three weeks. Yeah, and and it's totally different. I mean, yes, this these last three games, um, they could get hot and, and really build some momentum and make people feel better, but this is not the same as last year. I mean, last year, the other thing about last year was that was a young team that was uh, sort of finding its footing um, when they played Baylor, and uh, – you know, and then they got hot and they got better and they got experience and Trevor Knight got back in there and all that. Um, this year, for example, I, I think that the the best way I can put it is to say, at the end of last season in January, would OU have beaten Baylor in a rematch? Yes, I think they would have beaten Baylor in a rematch. This year, at the end of January, is there any way this team would beat Baylor in a rematch? No, absolutely not. <laughs> And and the difference is that was a young team finding its footing. This is a veteran team for the for the most part. Um, so it's just a massively disappointing season. But the only good thing I can say about the rest of the schedule, the only thing that's going to, I think, be interesting to watch is those young guys like Jordan Thomas, um, like Ahmad, Ahmad Thomas, like uh, maybe even uh, Zach Sanchez. I know he's had some really good success, but even for him, um, these are going to be Division One games playing against Division One players. Um, with a chance to really sort of get, you know, I, I guess get a better feel for things. Um, like I said, Zach Sanchez, I don't know that he really fits into that category. Well, and, but and is anybody going to even try to throw at Zach Sanchez? Baylor didn't try to throw at him the other day because they picked on Julian Wilson and Ahmad Thomas, and it wasn't as so much as picking on those guys as picking on the scheme because uh, really, and I keep going back to this first drive of the second half, but uh, – Ahmad Thomas and Julian Wilson made made all every tackle that they had an opportunity to make on that drive. Yeah, it was just the play came in front of them, and then then they tackled the receiver well downfield. Yeah, it was obvious they they were going to gain yards, and there was they, the OU uh, scheme or whatever didn't allow them the opportunity to make a play, and that's what they needed desperately on that drive. They needed a stop on that drive. A a turnover would have been ideal but even just a stop uh with no points allowed to give them some momentum because once Bay- like I said once Baylor scored that touchdown the game was over and uh like I mentioned none of these teams that OU plays here to end the season has the the depth at wide receiver or the the ability at quarterback to do the same things that Baylor did against Oklahoma but they're going to try to do similar things what can OU defensively do with the players that they've got right now, the guys that they're playing, to combat that? Is it finding a way to get more pressure? Is it just playing press coverage and you've got to take your chances with getting beat downfield with guys like Julian Wilson and, and Zach Sanchez have been beat downfield uh, some this season? But uh, what do you do? Well, first of all, I'm not going to pretend to be an expert. <laughs> um, I mean... Look, there's a reason that uh, that that you know Mike Stoops is a a highly successful and well paid defensive coordinator. It's because he's really smart a, about this stuff. Um, but the thing that I that I think about is you know against Alabama, um, that was a game in which I think everyone agrees that talent wise OU was overmatched, and they won um, because they were willing to take risks on defense. They blitzed they went after AJ McCarron and that could have backfired um but at least they were willing to try um to try things to you know to 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 try and impose their will and if things hadn't worked out and sometimes they didn't they got burned a couple times in that game um but at least they were trying to impose their will they were not just stepping back and responding to what the offense was doing they were forcing the offense to adapt to them and that's they haven't done that in some of these losses this year and that's what's so confusing to me, you know. It, play press coverage, and if it doesn't work, at least you tried. At least you put up a fight. Uh, blitz Eric Stryker, you know. And if it and if you get burned doing that, at least you tried. At least you put your best foot forward. And they're not doing that right now. And that's the thing that I don't understand. Yeah, and I'm with you. And I think OU has been there at their best on both sides of the ball when they've done that. When they've uh, you know, been willing uh, to get burned, to get the return. Uh, 
Uh, I mean, you look at uh, what their offense has done, uh, obviously not against Baylor last week, but even against Kansas State, they were able to move the ball pretty well. You know, you take out the two interceptions, and really that's a really good offensive day for them. I thought Josh Heupel had a fantastic day play calling that day, probably outside of the one uh, the, the one interception that Deron Neal threw um, right. in the end zone. But, uh, you know, they, they when, after they lost that TCU game, they made some adjustments offensively. They took some more risk. They let Trevor Knight run the ball around a little bit. And I actually agree with what Barry Trammell wrote uh, last week that Trevor Knight isn't a fantastic runner, but he's fast and he can, you know, make some, make some things happen on the ground and at least keep defenses honest with his legs. But uh, once they finally took that leash off of him, and part of that was, I think, Cody Thomas, the drive that he had against Kansas State and scored a touchdown. But like I said, on both sides of the ball, OU has been at their best when they've been willing to take risks. Yep. And I think you have to take risks on defense right now, especially with the personnel they've got in the secondary. Obviously, they don't feel uh, you know overly comfortable with that group outside of Sanchez probably. And, and Quentin Hayes, I think, has been a whole lot better than a lot of people uh uh, talk about just because he gets overshadowed by yeah. the, you know the the interceptions that Zach Chances has how well he's performed there and also uh, the struggles on the other side of the field with Ahmad Thomas and and Jordan or uh, Julian Wilson excuse me but uh, they do have to to blitz with guys like Stryker with guys in you know just the defensive line push with Charles Tapper and Chuka and Dulé coming off the edge Jordan Phillips has been fantastic but. You've got to just let Stryker do what he does in there. Uh, use Geno Grissom in that that same way coming off the other side, and get up and press and hope it works. And hope it works enough to where your offense can uh, make up for the failures uh, on the other side. Yeah, I mean, like I said, I mean that's that's the that's been the problem. And really, I think you can expand what I said a minute ago, even to the offense to a degree at the beginning of the year, where you had. Uh, you you didn't run Trevor Knight. You didn't allow him to do, um, you know, to to maybe do some of the things he does best in terms of his speed and his athleticism, um, because you were scared. They they didn't you know play press coverage. They didn't blitz because they were scared of what Bryce Petty would do, and that's just not that's not how you should play, especially when you have a veteran team, a team that's still in contention for the Big Twelve championship. I mean. Take some risks, and if they fail, they fail. But uh, like I said, at least you – if Trevor Knight got hurt, had gotten hurt earlier this year running the ball, at least you had tried to uh, to, to do the things that – to do the things that, that you know, made the decision to make him your starter last year so easy. I mean, it was – from from everything I've heard since the uh, – since the decision was made, since Trevor Knight was named the starter over Blake Bell at the beginning of 2013 – it wasn't really that close. They knew that Trevor Knight was going to be the guy, um, you know, at, at a certain point in fall camp, maybe midway through. Um, so, but the reason for that was because you wanted to take your offense in a different direction, and they just, um, and they were scared to do that. And then the other thing I think was interesting is, you know, Iowa State at Iowa State they ran that diamond formation so successfully, 500 yards rushing, and then I don't. I think they ran it once. I, I was, uh, that's what I was going to say. I don't Saturday. remember how if they ran it at all or if they did how much. But um, you know that was something that uh, someone asked Josh Heupel about yesterday, and he said, "You know, that's a fair question." <laughs> um, but it was something about the way Baylor lined up. But again, it's the same thing. You're reacting to what other people are doing rather than just imposing your will. And I don't know where where that changed from from the Sugar Bowl when OU decided they were going to do what they wanted to do and see what happened. I don't know how, what changed. It's the same coaching staff and many of the same players, and now they've switched to this philosophy of we're just going to react to what other people are doing. And that's just not what – you don't win championships doing that, in my opinion. Yeah, and it, it's one thing, going back to this, the diamond formation, it's one thing if you try it you know, five, seven, eight, ten times and it doesn't work. But to try it once and it doesn't work and then abandoning it just it doesn't make a whole lot of sense to me when it was so well-received uh, against Iowa State. I mean, you've got the running backs to do it. Blake Bell has done a, a pretty good job blocking when he's been back in that formation. Obviously, they're comfortable with Aaron Ripkowski and the job he does there. But uh, the running backs, you had another running back 
uh, Alec, or Keith Ford back in this game. He had a, a really good game when you look at his carries. Didn't have a whole lot of them, but uh, when he did have the ball, uh, performed well. And then you have Alex Ross, who has been so good for them the last few weeks, who doesn't get a carry until, uh, what, uh, second, third drive in the third quarter, and uh, his first carry breaks off 50 yards. Yeah, uh, and by that point, the game was over. <laughs> yeah. like, it was 38-14 to 14 when they gave him the ball the first time. I mean, um, so yeah, I mean, uh, and, we, and, we, we started off by saying that <laughs> Josh Heupel doesn't deserve a lot of criticism, and now well, what, what have we sat here and done? But, you know, uh, there are legitimate questions about that. I don't understand some of the thinking there. And giving Samaj P. Ryan five carries in that game, I mean— that's 37 less carries than he got against West Virginia. And we saw what happened against West Virginia. 37 carries at West Virginia where West Virginia beat Baylor. And to to bring this thing full circle, they beat Baylor without a couple of their best DBs by taking chances and coming up on the line and playing press coverage and hoping that their pressure got to Bryce Petty in time, and it did uh, often enough to help them win that game. Yeah, I mean— Again, I, 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 I do have to say again, we are not football <laughs> experts. Disclaimer. But, but some of this stuff <laughs> seems fairly obvious. Yes, it does. And I think, uh, you know, sometimes we make football out to be more complicated than it is. And, and there are things, obviously, in football that are very complicated and that are hard to pick out just by, you know, us observing but there are also sometimes where it's really obvious what's going on and what the problem is. Yeah, I mean, I, I feel like if if Mike and Bob invited me to sit in on one of their coaches' meetings, it might be like it was when I took calculus in high school. Just <laughs> what, um, what is going on, you know? But at the same time, it does sometimes seem like they overthink things. And you know, again, I, I don't know. I, I don't know. I don't know what to say. All right. Well, <laughs> uh, hopefully you can come up with something else to say because we're we still going to uh, talk about OU football for a little bit longer. Yeah. But uh, the biggest question, Jason, going into this week against Texas Tech, and uh, this is a Texas Tech defense especially that's struggled. I mean, over 80 points against TCU. They've given up a lot of points to offenses that aren't very good like Texas and, and some other ones. But the biggest question entering this week for OU on offense is, Who's going to play quarterback? Is it going to be Trevor Knight? We saw him uh, get hurt late in the game on Saturday against Baylor. Or will Cody Thomas uh, make his first start on Saturday? Well, I, I don't know. I I think, you know, if I was forced to pick it right now, I would probably lean towards Cody Thomas. I think that, you know, Trevor Knight was, was clearly in a lot of pain. He was, it sounds like, according to the report from our uh, our friend Kerry Murdoch, it sounds like he was uh, temporarily yeah. paralyzed a little bit and and things like that. I just don't know that you want to mess with um, a week later. I mean, it, it might not be a terrible idea, especially when you're playing a team like Texas Tech. It's not like there's any urgency. It's not like there's any championship they're still fighting for. Um, so to me, I, I don't see a whole lot of benefit in rushing Trevor Knight back into action in a game that they should win anyway. I mean, if you if you feel like you have to bring Trevor Knight and suit him up, let Cody start the game, and if things aren't going well, maybe make the switch and put Trevor in. But um, but to me, I I think you got to go with Cody Thomas this week, and 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 I think they can win with Cody Thomas. Yeah, and I think especially with the three running backs that we just talked about, Samaj P. Ron, Keith Ford, Alex Ross, those guys have done so well uh, this season individually. And this is a game where Texas Tech has really struggled to stop the run. Really, a lot of what you got to do is throw enough just to keep them honest, but most of the time, get the ball back in those guys' hands and let them work. I think this could be a game where Alex Ross could have a big game yeah. because I think he can find space against the Tech defense. Yeah, and I, I mean, I think you could see all three of OU's running backs have have pretty big games. Uh, you know, in this one, I, you know, we. Uh, the the thing that comes to mind to me is that Arkansas game where I mean, what did they throw five passes? Five passes and they won't, they scored forty nine points against Texas Tech. So um, to me, I, I think OU should be able to control this uh, control this game on the ground. And and if that's the case, you you may not have to ask Cody Thomas to do all that much. You know, the only thing I can 
the only thing I can see them getting into trouble is if they throw too much or if they try to throw too much. And, and Cody, you know, in his first career start on the road in Lubbock, we know what kind of place Lubbock can be for opposing teams. Um, all we got to do is, uh, go, uh, go watch that YouTube video where our, our pal JD Runnels is trying to, <laughs> trying to talk and, and, uh, go, is it go Raiders? Yeah. Um, it, and if you haven't seen that video, please look it up. Uh, it is, uh, an interesting watch and lets you know just what kind of place Lubbock is. Cause I, I know JD, I love JD, but it, you could tell the frustration with that was uh, really creeping in uh, and, after a few minutes of that, hearing that guy during interviews. And knowing him, <laughs> get, getting to know him the way we have the last couple of years, JD is not a guy I don't think who gets <laughs> angry very often, but I think in that moment he was starting to get really mad. Yeah. Although Kerry Murdoch, who's also in the video, uh, he was probably more angry than JD at that. I point. would have been too. If that <laughs> happens this weekend, I'm going to be upset. It's going to be really annoying to me. Well, the the thing that happened in that game that I don't think is going to happen on Saturday is Texas Tech won that game. Yeah, and that uh, led to that Yahoo uh, hanging around for that long afterwards. I don't think that'll be an issue this week, just because I don't think Texas Tech's defense is good enough to hang with OU. I think their offense is good enough to put up some points because. Uh, more because of the scheme that Cliff Kingsbury has, what they've done uh, offensively than any confidence in in their quarterback or their wide receivers. Although Davis Webb, uh, every once in a while, he'll step up and have a really good game, and we saw that in the bowl. Mm-hmm. Uh, but uh, he has struggled overall. It looks like he's going to play. By the way, Jason, Arkansas completed six passes I was uh, off. in that game. They were six of 12. So okay. 12 attempts okay. the entire game. And I was uh, off. they had 68. Eight rushing attempts. Yeah, that, I mean that's just insane what they were <laughs> able to do uh, to Texas Tech's defense. I mean, this is an Arkansas team that still has not won an SEC game. Uh, what since twenty twelve? Yes, and so, they're favored this weekend against LSU, that's which is goofy, man. unbelievable. That's goofy. <laughs> you need to go uh, go <laughs> if you if you're a gambler, go Lay go put some money on down LSU on the Tigers. <laughs> And the Tigers have played really well. Uh, to get completely off topic, LSU has played a whole lot better the last few weeks. They almost beat Bama. Obviously, I know that it was heartbreaking for them the way that game ended uh, against Alabama, but uh, they seemingly had that game won with a minute left and let it slip away, and now they're uh, underdogs against a, a team that hasn't won a conference game in the SEC Uh since uh, 2012. And and they beat Ole Miss, which is a really good team, and they almost beat Mississippi State. I mean, I think that this is an LSU team. We are way off the rails here, but um, <laughs> this is an LSU team that, that I think that had started the season. They were finding their way, but they're darn good now. So, I don't know. Anyway, let's <laughs> we, we probably ought to get back to OU before uh, people uh, delete this podcast. <laughs> And never listen again. Well, let's hope that doesn't happen because <laughs> uh, we, we've got uh, Aaron Dickens from uh, RedRaiderSports.com who's going to join us on Thursday and really looking forward to that. So we hope you'll listen to that. Yeah. But uh, finally, Jason, what's something that we haven't talked about that uh, you're really looking to see out of OU on Saturday or just uh, the rest of the season uh, that you're interested in as uh, as this season wraps up uh, mercifully. Well, the thing that I'm actually the most interested in, I think that we haven't talked about yet is the fans and and the way that this the way that they're going to support the team moving forward. Um, you know, the the fan relationship with with Bob Stoops um, I think is going to be interesting to watch. I mean, um, I think there's a good chance that the next home game, the KU game uh, I I don't see any way that that's a full house for that game. I I think and it will gonna... it will be technically a sellout. Let's well, let's get that yeah, off the board. Okay. But let's put the air quotes up. Yeah. Uh, but you know what I mean. I mean yeah. I, I don't think that they're gonna have a full house for Kansas. Uh, I think there's a good chance there'll be a on lot a of mid November morning. I think there'll be a lot of empty seats, and I and you know it'll be interesting to see the way that 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 goes. I, I think that. Um, the way that Bob Stoops talks sometimes, I don't know if he necessarily means to, but he alienates a lot of fans with the way he talks in press conferences when he's asked about fans. Um, and and look, I understand him being a little bit maybe short with that question after the game. Um, I, I don't think he should have been, but I understand it. He'd just gotten, you know, 
you know, Hammered. Beat, beaten up and down the field. And, uh, and, you know, I'm sure that the last thing he wants to think about is what, what fans are, well, are thinking. But like... at the same time, I, you know, he's got to remember, I think sometimes that these are the people that have made him wealthy. These are the people that have, uh, supported him, um, through all these years. Uh, these are the fans that, that hung with him through some tough years. Um, some, you know, the, the, the year that, uh, that, that Sam Bradford got hurt, the year that Rhett Bomar was the quarterback and they weren't as good. They almost lost to Tulsa at home. I mean, these fans have stuck with him through a lot. And, uh, and sometimes I think that, that he tends to, to forget. I don't know if he forgets it, but he, he, he doesn't acknowledge it, I don't think, the way that he should sometimes. And it, and it seems like, and Jenny Carlson touched on this uh, today in her column, this is uh, in, in Tuesday's paper, she she wrote about uh, social media and, and not only Bob Stoops, but Mike Gundy as well. It seems like with Stoops at least, and I haven't been around Gundy, so but it seems like it's the same thing, especially after listening to uh, a, a radio show. Our friend uh, Kerry Murdoch, listening to him this morning driving in, and they played a clip from uh, our own Kyle Fredrickson asking Mike Gundy uh, after their loss at K-State. Uh, about how do you keep the fans involved and invested. And he went off the rails about social media. Bob Stoops does it too. It seems like their disdain for social media, and that, and that's completely fair. I understand that it's not for everybody. It makes their job tougher. It frankly makes our job tougher. But it's something that it's just a reality of mm-hmm. of what, what is right now. Yeah, uh, Their disdain of social media keeps – keeps Bob from realizing that those people that are on social media are the same people that are sitting in the stands on Saturday, uh, usually afternoon. We should say probably morning uh, this year because it seems like every uh, home game is an 11 a.m. kickoff this mm-hmm. year. But uh, are those same fans that are sitting in the stands, that those same fans that are watching every minute of it on TV and uh, – this is just the way it is right now. You don't express your frustrations by writing letters to Joe Stiglione and Bob Stoops anymore. You express your frustrations by, uh, you know, blasting it out on Twitter and and saying uh, what you think of the game. And uh, both of us and and every other uh, reporter this weekend got hit with uh, both barrels of it yeah. uh, late in that game, listening to the fans react to what they were seeing. Yeah, I mean, and and that's that's right. You know, the I, one guy on Twitter, I can't remember if it's yesterday or if it was post game, said in response to what I, it, it had to have been yesterday because it was about social media. Um, in response to Stoops' comment about, you know, he, he appreciates the fans. His comments were about social media. This guy said, Well, what if I'm a season ticket holder, a Sooner Club member, uh, and uh, on and complain on social media? I mean, that's, <laughs> the, that's the reality of it. It's not like um, the fans that complain on social media are the fans that, you know, don't go to any games, that have never even been in the state of Oklahoma. It's not like that's them. The fans that are complaining on social media, many of them, are the same ones that he's professing to appreciate. And that's, I mean, it's just, it's bad. It's not, it's not, there's no easy answer for it. And again, I understand to a a point where Bob is coming from. I mean, he can't, if he spent all his time worrying about (laughs) trying to do everything the fans wanted him to do, um... Well, he'd be on uh, what his sixteenth offensive coordinator is probably yeah. is uh, probably is what fiftieth quarterback at this point. I mean, it's not <laughs> it's not feasible, but at the same time, you do have to be sensitive to their concerns. I mean, again, these are the people that pay your salary. These are the people that you know that fund your stadium renovations. That that uh, that, that ha- have made have made him who he is in many ways um, over the last almost two decades. Yeah, and uh, the the tweet, Jason, I found it. He said, uh, in response to your tweet, which was uh, the uh, a blog post about Bob Stoops clarifying his post-game remarks on OU fans, this this fan tweeted, but what am I, I'm a fan and in Sooner Club and complaining on social media, to which uh, another one of your followers responded, uh, people on social media aren't real people, which is in some level where the disconnect comes from i think yeah I, yeah i think so and it and it's in all levels it's you know people uh you know saying personal things to to athletes and coaches and and others involved with athletics i mean we we hear people say stuff about us uh in a way that 
you know they would never say this stuff to you in person. Right. It's just uh, they're able to disconnect that from actually being a real person on the other end. Yeah, and that's that's true. And, you know, that that's the thing. Just because they're saying it on social media and just because they're saying it in a certain way doesn't make what they're saying um, – stupid in itself you know like i yeah. mean I, people say stupid things i mean people yeah. say stupid things to us but and, it's not stupid just things. because of where it's yeah at. yeah I, yeah exactly i mean if somebody came up to me and called me baldy <laughs> you know <laughs> I, i've person, never heard that, anybody call you that that, that, Jason. Would be, that would be stupid it just as it's stupid on social media but just because it was said on social media doesn't make it stupid if that makes sense yeah Absolutely. Well, we've uh, we've gone completely off the rails here in the last uh, <laughs> it's all relevant. 15, 20 minutes or so, but it's all relevant. It's all interesting uh, to us, at least. But thank you so much for joining us. We'll be back, like I said, Thursday. Aaron Dickens from Red Raider Sports uh, will be joining us and really looking forward to it again. Uh, 2.30 p.m., not an 11 a.m. game, uh, Sooner fans. So you've got uh, a little bit extra time to get ready. 2.30 p.m. on Saturday uh, from Lubbock. Uh, it should be interesting in a lot of ways because of uh, the quarterback situation, what OU does on defense, all kinds of things. I don't think OU is going to have a problem, but uh, will be uh, fun to watch. Well, Jason, uh, thanks for uh, joining us today and, and taking the time. We always uh, always have fun with it. Yeah, it's, uh, it's <laughs> this podcast has become one of my favorite things about, uh, about this job. So Absolutely. Hope you guys enjoy it. Too. <laughs> all right. Well, check us out every day at newsok.com and every morning in the Oklahoma for the best OU coverage anywhere.